we were probably the first in Ukraine to connect cultural erasure with the policy of the Russian Federation regarding the movable cultural heritage. The fact that cultural heritage is undoubtedly a factor of national security. And Russia is not doing it only now. They've been doing this for a hundred years. This war is not a war for territories, but a war for identity. Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames a special project by Ukraine Media Center, an NGO Euro-Atlantic course, and I'm your host, Miroslava Yeremkiv. When more than 946 objects of cultural infrastructure were damaged or destroyed due to Russian aggression. Such data was made public by the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy in February this year. 317 of them, which is 16%, were completely destroyed. The largest group of objects damaged or destroyed by the Russian military are local cultural hubs. They make up 48% of the total number of institutions. Other destroyed institutions also include libraries, museums, galleries, theaters, parks, nature reserves, and more. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the cultural heritage lost to Russian occupation in Ukraine, exploring avenues for the return of these treasures to their rightful home. If you want to learn more about this subject, please continue watching this video and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our videos in the future. After the liberation of Kherson, it became known that the Russian occupiers looted the local art and history museums and took away a large number of valuable exhibits. 80% of the works were removed from the Kherson Art Museum alone, and the occupiers used 70 trucks to remove valuables from the local history museum. The occupying authorities of the Kherson region then claimed that the exhibits were being evacuated to a safe place. Subsequent Subsequently, information emerged regarding the transfer of funds from the Kherson region to the occupied Crimea. There are reportedly now 10,000 of paintings missing. The international human rights organization Human Rights Watch labeled this act as theft of Ukrainians of their national heritage and deemed it as a war crime. More on crimes against cultural heritage, please welcome leading researcher of the National Reserve Kyiv Pachersk Lavra and head of the monitoring group of the Crimean Institute of Strategic Studies, Denis Yashny. For example, until 2022, the most common type of violations in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol was, of course, illegal archaeological excavations, which have already destroyed about 150 archaeological heritage sites. And in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, it is the use of archaeological sites for military purposes. For the most part, the mounds in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions either became part of the fortification systems of Russian proxies, or they came under fire if Ukrainian troops tried to deploy on the territory of the mound groups uh, during the fighting. So, in fact, all the violations that happened in 2022 were the same. It's just that the number of violations has multiplied, this is the first. And secondly, the emphasis shifted proportionally to war crimes, um, military aggression against cultural heritage. Most of the mounds were destroyed by fortifications and shelling. Although many people talk about uh, changes on the battlefield. A lot of cheap barrage munitions appeared and therefore, for example, mounds gradually ceased to be used as part of fortifications because it's it no longer makes sense there is no point in setting up observation posts anymore we all say the building of the mariupol art museum is destroyed or a museum in kherson was robbed but we must understand that the number of archaeological monuments is huge there are about 10,000 burial mounds in the Donetsk region, about 7,000 in the Luhansk region, and almost 8,000 in the Kherson region, and most of these mounds are destroyed during the fighting. Back in 2018, when we were working on the case of the Khan's Palace, we realized that under the guise of restoration of the Khan's Palace, they replaced authentic material culture, that is roofs, frescoes, paintings, 
everything with uh, the so-called new products, remakes. Consequently, the value of the facility is completely erased. It disappears as a carrier of technology and culture. And so, in 2018, we were probably the first in Ukraine to connect cultural erasure with the policy of the Russian Federation regarding the movable cultural heritage. The Russian occupying forces also took exhibits from museums in the occupied part of the Zaporizhia region. In particular, it is known that a collection of Scythian gold was stolen from the Melitopol Local History Museum. The Zaporizhia Regional Military Administration reported in April 2022 that museum workers who cooperated with the occupiers helped the Russian military find this precious collection. Director of the Cultural Heritage Department of the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine, Mariana Tomin, believes that these actions are aimed at the complete destruction of us as a Ukrainian nation. Let's hear what she has to say. There can be no documentation without monitoring. All the huge work that has been done is scientific, substantiated, expert, and this all will make an evidence base of crimes. I hope our law enforcement agencies will bring all the stories to the point where they will be considered by the International Criminal Court in the context of genocidal crimes. Because crimes against cultural heritage clearly confirm the genocide committed by the Russian Federation on our territory. What would I like to draw attention to very briefly? The fact that cultural heritage is undoubtedly a factor of national security. And Russia is not doing it only now. They've been doing this for a hundred years. After World War I and World War II, a lot of cultural property items were transported to the Russian Federation and legalized there as part of their museum fund. What we have now is just a consequence, a barbaric desperation aimed not just at destruction, but at the complete destruction of us as a Ukrainian nation. I believe that it should be positioned in this way. When talking about legislative initiatives, a legislative block, we must take into account that in this context Russia acts as coldly as possible too. The Russian Federation adopted relevant legislative acts in 2015 and in 2022, which recognized all the property that was looted and lost during hostilities as a museum fund of the Russian Federation. In this way, they don't just steal, they legalize it in their legal field. I'm sure that there is a solution to all this, and the work of experts is an invariable component in this process. I think we'll continue to support such initiatives, we'll support them at the highest level, in front of donors, and ask that such a higher level of expertise continues to be an invariable component of the process in which we're all interested, in our victory and in proper documentation and proof of those terrible genocidal crimes of Russia against our people. It is known that some museums in the occupied part of the Zaporizhia region have resumed their operations, but have altered their narratives to align with the Russian occupation policy. The three main narratives now portrayed are the imperial good brought forth by the colonization during the era of Catherine the Great. The second narrative is the manipulative portrayal of mutual involvement in World War II of Ukrainian and Russian soldiers as one army. And the third narrative is the glorification of local collaborators as heroes in the context of the Russian special military operation, SVO, promoting the idea of Russian world that brought prosperity to the so-called liberated territories of the Zaporizhia region. 
Head of the Cultural Heritage Department at the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine, Lina Doroshenko, will elaborate on the significance of collecting accurate documentation for prosecution in cases like this and discuss the protective mechanisms and their role in safeguarding our cultural facilities. The issue of documentation is very important for us now. Documentation in two aspects. Documentation for recovery and documentation for persecution. Both cases are based on quality monitoring, which can be used as a starting point to move these initiatives forward. Another aspect is interaction with international partners. First, it is communicating what is happening in Ukraine, because this war is not a war for territories, but a war for identity. According to the latest information of the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy, 933 cultural heritage sites have been damaged and destroyed, and at the same time 1,946 cultural infrastructure facilities, including more than 100 museums, have also been damaged or destroyed. So informing the international community about the scale of destruction and the situation we have inside Ukraine against the backdrop of the war is one component. The other component is synchronization of our national legislation with the norms of international law, on the one hand, and at the same time identifying the gaps that exist in international law given Ukraine's unique experience. Because as practice has shown, last year Ukraine did a lot in the context of implementing the 1954 Hague Convention for the Preservation of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict and its second protocol. In particular, this is the introduction of 25 objects under enhanced protection. So now we are marking these objects. And there is an issue of responsibility. We are fulfilling and implementing the provisions of international humanitarian law. What's next? What are the mechanisms of protection? How it will protect our facilities? I think it now requires an expert discussion, and we as a state must propose, perhaps show, what has to be improved in the context of what the war showed in the middle of Europe, in our country, in the context of the challenges we now face in the case of preserving cultural heritage. I believe that your activities in this context and your expert decisions, as shown by our experience of cooperation, is very potential precisely in the context of this legal expertise. Analysis of our legislation and proposals, recommendations for the implementation of these international norms on one hand. And on the other hand, it is a continuation of monitoring, because unfortunately every day the list of destroyed damaged facilities is growing. We must keep our finger on the pulse in order to make the best use of the tools from international law and from our national legislation in order to preserve our cultural heritage and our uniqueness on the one hand and to preserve Ukrainian culture as a significant part of European culture in general. You've been watching a special project of Ukraine Media Center and Euro-Atlantic course dedicated to the Russian-Ukrainian war, Ukraine in Flames. In the description under this video, you can find information on how you can help Ukraine fight Russian aggression. If you find our work useful, please like and share this video. Slava Ukraini!